find out what you really, really want to do. What drives you and what's kind of that thing that you're looking at that gets you super excited. Once you figure that out, go and find somebody that's already done it and offer them value. Maybe even team up with them. But learn what they know and perhaps form a partnership. If you do that one thing, you're going to save yourself so much time and energy. I've done that ever since the beginning. Welcome to the Entrepreneur's Journey Podcast, where we delve into the stories of successful entrepreneurs so you can discover what's possible. Today's guest is Corey Sanchez. I just finished listening to an audiobook about the foundation of Home Depot, a company you probably know about. It's a very large, multi-billion dollar company in the United States that sells home renovations and repairs products. So I learned about how this company was founded and the message I kept hearing was customer service is their number one value and also the number one reason why they believe they are successful and became market leaders. This reminded me of the message I heard from another book I listened to many years ago about the foundation of Zappos, the online retailer of shoes that later got acquired by Amazon. The founder and and that whole book talked about the importance of customer service. And I feel like this is a message that seems to be repeated over and over again in these entrepreneur founder bio books that customer service is the most important thing to create a market leading super successful business, whether offline or online, whatever the case may be. And this made me think back to the very early days starting my business. I used to do customer service myself entirely through email. And at first, I really loved it. I was replying to potential customers and current customers, answering their questions, convincing them to buy from my business. And it was fun. But then eventually, I started to get a little overrun with a lot of queries. A lot of people, you know, ask me about my products and services, whether it's right for them. And then a lot of technical issues would come in like, you know, a link is not working on my website or how do they access this resource or, you know, where can they download that or they can't open a PDF. And these these kind of emails kept coming in day after day. And eventually the more successful I got, the more of these emails I got. And I got really tired of replying to the same questions over and over again. Now, I knew that I could start building, you know, template replies to answer the most common queries, which I did, but I very quickly became overrun with this job. I'd wake up in the morning and I'd have to spend three hours just replying to messages. And, you know, there were a lot of important messages in there, a lot of potential customers I could be losing if I don't reply to those emails with a good, thorough, carefully crafted email to give them the information they need. So I was concerned if I stopped doing this, my business is not going to work, yet I'm getting less and less time in my life to do anything else other than email. So that's the day I realized I needed to bring on someone else to help me with this very important customer service role, handling the email in my business. And that's why I'm so excited today to introduce you to a new sponsor of this podcast, inboxdone.com, which is a service where you can bring on board a person to take over email in your business and your life. And I want to highlight how important that is to bring on a person who can take over customer service in your business, in particular, email customer service. So if anything I said there resonated with your current situation, with how you deal with email, you know, you're getting a lot of those kind of queries and you're feeling like you're potentially missing out on business or you're not doing as good a job as you could dealing with really important queries from people who potentially want to buy from you or even current customers who have bought from you or the more mundane queries like I can't open this PDF or this link gave me a 404, I can't find this resource kind of emails. They're boring, but it's important you've got someone who's answering those questions and not only answering them, but building systems, creating templates and automatic sequences of emails that chase up potential customers or deal with potential refunds, processes to really deliver exceptional customer service. And all of this can be happening without you being the person delivering those emails or writing those emails or creating those templates. Certainly not the person who logs in every day and puts in all this time to deal with something that 
is never going to end. You're always going to get email as long as you have a successful business. And in fact, you're only going to get more and more as you become more and more successful. So I recommend if this is your situation, you check out the inboxdone.com service and hire someone who can essentially become your entire customer support team just by hiring this one person from Inbox Done to take over email in your business. Now, it can do a lot more than that for you, but I recommend to find out all the details, just go to inboxdone.com, check out the website, and you'll find an application form there where you can apply for your very own email inbox manager who could take over customer service in your business, which would potentially can change your life. You can take this completely off your plate and go to sleep relaxed, stress-free, knowing that customer service is being handled by a dedicated person whose job is to deal with those emails every day for you. That's inboxdone.com. Go check them out. Hello, this is Yarrow and welcome to another interview. Today on the line, I have a guest with me who I recently connected with at the Social Media Marketing World Conference slash Traffic and Conversion Conference, which were both uh, one after the other in San Diego recently. And my guest today was someone who, I'll be honest, I did not know prior to us meeting. As, as things happen in conferences, you tend to kind of just randomly connect with people through other people, through shared dinners and just talking in the hallways. And I had a great long conversation with my guest. Um, and discovered that he has an interesting background. Now, he's most known for having a seven-figure uh, business around LinkedIn marketing, and we'll talk a lot about what that is. It's got a, a software as a service arm. It's It's got a lot, and I don't know much about it, so I'm looking forward to learning about that. But also, my guest and I had a conversation about a whole range of things, including some really interesting uh, biology, DNA. There's a lot of science in my guest's background, so we're going to learn about how all these this connects together. I'd like to welcome Corey Sanchez. Corey, hello. Hey, hello. Thanks for having me on. Uh, well, thanks for, for agreeing to come on. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to learning more because I, I feel like we opened up quite a few interesting conversation topics and we didn't even talk about business in most of those conversations. So I want to hear the, uh, the business story too. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's really great when you can sit down with somebody and have like deep, meaningful conversations that kind of just rock. I mean, really, honestly, it was a, it was a truly amazing convo. So yeah, this is going to be fun. I hope we can do that today and share that with everyone listening in as well. So, um, but I, I've, let's start at the beginning, Corey. Now, I haven't asked this. We were kind of just joking around somewhat about this with your family background and uh, how you got married and your mother-in-law and all these stories. But simply from your name, Corey Sanchez, uh, I'm assuming there's some South American connection here. So where, where, where's your family from or where were you born and raised? I was, uh, my, my mom is from Michoacan, Mexico, and um, she came here in the States. We live in, I, I live like right now in Scottsdale, Arizona. My dad's from California um, and I have, I'm part uh, Native American and part Hispanic, but totally grew up in the suburbs of Arizona and uh, first generation. Um, so it's, uh, and actually everybody always expects me to know Spanish, right? Just based on the way I look and, and, uh, also my last name. And surprisingly enough, uh, I do not. And I'm, I'm working to correct that right now because I'm spending 12 months in 12 different cities around the world. And, uh, and so every day, you know, I spend a couple hours learning Spanish or having Spanish conversations. So it's a slow going process, but yeah. by the end of the year, I do want to fix me not knowing Spanish. <laughs> uh, for my upbringing. So. <laughs> uh, so you can completely fit the cliche then, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, or at least not look like a traitor when I'm in right. uh, Mexico. <laughs> so. I recently attempted to learn Ukrainian while in Ukraine, and my father's Ukrainian, so, you know, same kind of story. I should know how to speak it, but I don't. <laughs> it's really hard. <laughs> it's not like, it's not a, you know, a, a couple of months. I know Tim Ferriss talks about learning a language in six weeks and so on, but, you know, it's it's quite difficult. Um, yeah. I'm curious with your, so your father being Native American, what part of uh, America is he native to? Uh, well, he's, he's, his family is from California. And, um, and actually, 
it's not really his family. His family actually hails from Spain like many, many, many generations ago, right? And um, my mom is actually the one. She's part Native American and all, also part Mexican American, oh. right? So yeah, so from really the um, uh, so really some from Central America and uh, also part of the Southern uh, United States. So. Uh, yeah. So, that's, so when you say, because I get confused here, when you say Native American, it could be the entire continental America, not just North America. Like you could be Mexican Native American. That, yes, right? correct. There's a there's a little bit of uh, of Aztec as well. But you have oh. to imagine, like we don't, um, you know, I, I should really look this up on Ancestry and just see see what that's like. But uh, I don't know if they really kept great records, you know, going back that far. That, far. that would be interesting. So you have a little bit of Aztec blood in you. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. cool. That's that's yeah. You definitely need to speak something. Well, they, they didn't speak Spanish, did they? That was the in, invader language. They spoke their their native tongue. Is, is <laughs> I'm guessing there's not much remnants of whatever the Aztecs used to speak. I yes, I fathom you. You would be right because you know I'm I'm studying a lot because I'm traveling a lot through Latin America right now, and you know uh, Spaniards were I mean great, excellent travelers, global travelers, um, excellent at um, colonizing, but also very brutal in how they dealt with indigenous tribes. And uh, so a lot of them, you know, they just they, they just wiped out and they just um, they they took whatever they had and, and took it for themselves. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I read uh, Sapiens recently from Yuval, uh, the history of us, and, and there's quite a lot of about the, the colonization process. And, and the Spanish part was quite interesting because it was such a small group of Spaniards who actually did conquer these kingdoms and they were very clever about it. They went straight to the top and kind of held the king hostage and it's just the the locals the indigenous population never considered that you know these strange foreigners could actually take over their whole country and of course you've got you know dying from the common cold and things like that as well being a problem but anyway we're not here for a history lesson i could probably talk to you about that for a while but so how does a native uh mexican american mother meet so is it a californian spanish father how do you do you know the story about how that came together yeah, they they met at a community college in um, in Northern California, and uh, I think for my dad it was um, it was love at first sight, right? <laughs> and uh, which which is pretty awesome and pretty rare. But um, he he asked her to a dance, and um, and she said no originally, right? And so <laughs> uh, because because my dad was he was kind of had that. He, a lot of women thought he was dating all kinds of people, right? So he had that kind of player, <laughs> like mystique to him. Right. And uh, and she was like, I don't want to go with you because you know you're dating all these other ladies. Like, no, I'm not not dating any of them. I want to date you. And uh, and so that's that's kind of how it happened. So she said yes after that. And uh, my dad um, joined the navy and uh, was in the navy for for six years. And then uh, he, he worked on submarines. And so it's interesting because, you know, their, their relationship, they had a very short relationship on the front end and they joined and then he was in, he was in there for like a number of years. They almost all didn't see each other. Um, but pretty incredible. They actually located after service, uh, his service was done into Arizona and, uh, that's where they started raising a family. And I always, it's always kind of interesting because like, you know, even though it was, it was love at first sight and they always had this very tight connection and, and bond, it's almost like. You get to know each other more after, you know, he's home and, uh, and you know, back from traveling the world in a submarine. So that's uh, that's how we came to find ourselves in Arizona. Right. So you were raised in, as you said, a sort of suburban Arizona lifestyle. Did your parents kind of have normal jobs then or was your you know dad still in the Navy or how did that work? What was the... So, he, yeah, he got recruited to work at a Arizona... A power plant, right? A nuclear power plant, and because obviously he worked in a he worked in a nuclear sub, and so he was a uh, top line contender to work in this power plant. So that's where he worked for um, basically all uh, up until he he uh, passed away. Um, passed away kind of young, about um, eight years ago, and uh, um, from cancer. But up until then, he he'd always worked at the plant, and he he drove um, an hour and a half. We lived about an hour and a half away from the plant, and so he would drive that every single day, work a 12-hour shift, and then drive back. Wow. Pretty incredible if you take a look at it. I mean, just the work ethic is just, I mean, it's astounding. 
right? So did uh, this work ethic pass on to you? Well, I, it it really did because I mean, being an entrepreneur, you you have to have work ethic. It's pretty it's pretty difficult to be the kind of entrepreneur you would want to be, and uh, and and so he passed a lot of that um, down to me, and I also learned part of that from gymnastics because I did gymnastics for thirteen years, wow. starting from when I was eight. And um, my mom, um, she she actually took on a jo- uh, part time job. She was an assistant librarian just so she could put me through gymnastics, right? Because gymnastics can be pretty expensive with the competitions and the the uniforms and the travel and the, just the lessons alone are very expensive. So were you going pro? Um, was this like an Olymp- Olympic endeavor? Yeah. I, so I did it. Um, I was a junior Olympian up uh, in in and an All American in high school. So I went to nationals and um, um, I actually competed competed with the national with the what's called the regional team so it's composed of uh california arizona nevada and hawaii and so um so we would all those uh states would compete against each other to uh to be top ranked in the region and then um i was one of those gymnasts and then we went on to perform and compete in the national stage and we won second place out of all the other regions um so that was that was really exciting, and I was actually top one of the top in the country on pommel horse and rings. So I was, uh, so I, you know, I did have aspirations. I, I from there I went into college, and we were national champions, right? And because uh, I went to Arizona State, and uh, we had a phenomenal team, and that's when I kind of retired. I hung up the grips after that because <laughs> <laughs> you got to imagine after doing it for 13 years. I'm in college now. I'm um, trying to. Um, at this point, I'm a biomedical engineer. I'm um, also training for gymnastics. I'm also coaching gymnastics because I needed some income. Um, my dad was, you know, obviously fabulous at the upbringing, but you know, when I was a, uh, I think he, I think he, when I was 16, he was like, "Hey, hey, son, um, I want you to come in here and uh, let's talk about college." And so I was like, oh, "Okay, great, yeah," because um, obviously it had been a little bit on my mind, and you know, got to get prepared for it. And so he's like, "Okay, well, um, so you're gonna have to find um, your own scholarships and funding for college because um, I'm I'm not gonna pay for it." And uh, he's like, "All right, good chat." And so that was <laughs> <laughs> that was that. And uh, you know, I, I you know, but it, actually that turned out to be a huge blessing for me because it really made me work hard. And I was a hard worker because um, of gymnastics and all that and what I've, I've gotten from him. And so it really made me work hard. And part of that was working through school to you know, be able to, I don't know, keep the ramen on the table, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Between the noodles. Um, yeah. Oh. So during this whole sort of college and even before that school uh, gymnastics period of your life, it doesn't sound like there were any entrepreneurial aspirations. You said you were doing sort of biomedical sciences. So did did uh, your decision making around even what to study in college all revolve around some kind of potential career in, in biomedical studies or what was your thinking? Well, OK, let me let me tell you, I'll take you back to my first um, entrepreneurial endeavor, which was a complete failure. I was eight years old <laughs> and uh, okay. we in my house, we grew like we had these like really fabulous grapefruit trees, right? We had um, orange trees and grapefruit trees. And my abuelita, she was visiting at the time, and she wanted me to go door to door and sell grapefruits. Now, um, (laughs) for me, you got to imagine at this point, you know, I'm eight years old. I don't like grapefruits, you know. Um, I don't know a lot of eight-year-olds who do. And she's asking me to sell this product that uh, (laughs) I don't even like. And so, like, I'm carrying this wagon around from door to door. I'm trying to sell it. I knock on a couple of doors, praying that they don't open it. And, uh, and then finally I catch somebody and I just did such a botched job of like selling these grapefruits. I, um, I just went around back and I, uh, <laughs> I, I just put them, I threw them in, in the dumpster and, uh, and then I carried myself back with an empty wagon. I said, yeah, um, you know, I, I kind of dug in a, a couple of like my spare change and said, no, here's what I got. And so, and, uh, and that was that. And I learned, I learned the first critical lesson of entrepreneurship, which is you got to sell a product you love and, uh, <laughs> otherwise it's not going to work. <laughs> but, or, or uh, you just hide your inventory. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I was, so there's, I had, you know, you hear a lot of stories about like really successful entrepreneurs and they start like at a young age and they're like selling comic books or, you know, pogs or whatever it is to like other school children. They got some kind of, you know, side hustle. And I had none of that. I had zero entrepreneurial fabric, I think in, in me those early days. So 
you know, I was. Was there any examples around you, Corey? Like, it doesn't sound like your parents were. So any, anyone in your family or any kind of people were doing their own business? The, the only person that I had in my life that was an entrepreneur um, was my gymnastics coach. And he was the owner of the, of the facility. And so I got to, you know, I got to watch him kind of wheel and deal from his coach's chair and make stuff happen. Um, and that was, you know, whether I knew it or not, I was definitely absorbing certain aspects of him. I actually told him later on, he was my first, like, kind of, uh, he's my first mentor, or like, uh, you know, um, entrepreneurial kind of like uh, entity that I looked up to, right? And uh, yeah, that was it. But that was, I, yeah, I didn't have very much entrepreneurial activity going on in my family at that point. So what were you thinking was in your future? So I thought I was going to be a doctor, right? Okay. That's, um, well, actually, first off, I thought um, I'm in sixth grade. You know, when they ask, like, what do you want to be? A lot of people want to be police officers, firemen. Um, you know, some people want to be astronauts, right? All I wanted to be um, there was a sports team in in my hometown called the Phoenix Suns. They had a mascot called the Phoenix Suns Gorilla. And all I wanted to be at that point was the Phoenix Suns Gorilla. <laughs> and <laughs> so I wore Phoenix Suns Gorilla shirts. I had all the merch. And uh, that's what I wanted to be. And, and how, tell- how old were you then? <laughs> Um, sixth grade. So whatever that okay. happens to be, you know, <laughs> so, old, old enough to know <laughs> better, I guess. You could right. Say, maybe well, not, not quite old enough. <laughs> no, not really. Cause I, my teacher literally told me, right. And this was a specific word. She's like, and this was like a game changer for me. I, it like hit, hit me from left field, had no idea. And she said, you know, that's a part-time job, right? And I was like, they completely blew my mind and uh, altered the course of my future forever, right? right, so, right. <laughs> crushed, um, crushed your dreams. Crushed right my there. dreams. Yeah. yeah, crushed my dreams. Okay. And, uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that, that's, what, that's what I wanted to be um, up until that very moment. And then I, I kind of figured it out later on that I wanted to be a doctor. Okay. And uh, Why? What was the drive uh so you know doctors were respected um everybody talked about doctors being respected members of the community i like biology love biology so i figured hey um maybe this is going to be something for me um and so i remember distinctly i'm in uh freshman year of college and so everything that i'm doing is doing to prepare to be a doctor i'm in the honors college right because it'll look good for you know the med- you know it look for good for medical schools when i'm applying i'm i'm an engine i'm working to be an engineer which by the way i decided i wasn't going to be an engineer because i really don't like physics and and math all that much so um and then i'm also preparing for the mcat like i'm i'm literally you know, uh, sophomore year, I'm preparing for the MCAT. I'm, I'm, um, uh, I'm, I'm really like uh, aggressively pursuing internships. So I'm, I'm working at the hospital and doing all that stuff. And then I went to this one that was like kind of like this career day for people that are looking to be a doctors. And I went to that. It was in Tucson, Arizona. I drove an hour and a half there and and met up with all these doctors. And I kind of like I, I got to ask one of these doctors a question. I said, Hey, knowing what you know about being a doctor and obviously being one would you do it all over again? And he looked at me and said the most profound thing that really made like put a uh, screeching halt to all my endeavors. And he said, no. And, <laughs> okay. And so, why, why was that profound? <laughs> uh, because um, you got to imagine that you're climbing a mountain and uh, you get to the, you get to the mountain or you get to a like an observation point And then um, the sign says, you know, this way to mountain. And that's the mountain I really want to go to. And it's like, you know, I get a, it's like a wall the way over there. I'm not even on the right mountain, you know? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. um, so really kind of, it was good that that happened, right? Because it kind of put me on another thing. Um, and I was like, all right, so I'm not going to be a doctor. What else am I going to be? I, I got to ask though, like, <laughs> if it's one person who just may have had a bad experience being a doctor, and if you talk to the 10 people over there who said they loved it, <laughs> you know, it, do you th- see this as fate perhaps? Or, you know, were there more indications that you didn't want to do it? Or maybe you knew deep down you didn't want to do it? Because I'd hate to think one person, you know, changed the course of your life. Obviously, you've had a great life since then. But you know, it's, 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 it's a pivotal turning point. That seems like one variable, you know, only. Yeah, but you gotta imagine, like, at this point, I'd done a lot of stuff with medical professionals, like I'd intern at the hospital, I did all kinds of studies at the Phoenix Children's Hospital about asthma studies and work with children and worked in a hospital. And so at this point, I'm thinking, I really don't like working in the hospital. Like, this is my entire thing. And so um, 
I really don't like it. And frankly, I just, I don't know if this is for me. So you got to imagine that question that erupted. I was looking for an answer and I got the answer that I wanted. Right. Right. Um, of course, I could have asked some more people. Right. I, and I could have got some other answers. Mm. But it's almost like that, you knew the answer already. But then this kind of just was a slap in the face going, duh, look, no, you don't want to do this. Yeah. And you got to imagine I'm in, I, uh, I'm in. MCAT class, like the Princeton Review, it co- the course cost $3,500. This was the only thing that my dad actually paid for during my entire schooling, right? Because partially, like, I think maybe part of the reason I wanted to be a doctor is because, I don't know, he, he had suggested it at some point. I don't really remember, but um, but so he had paid 3500 And so a big part of me is like, I don't know if this is for me. I really don't. And like, I, I don't want to continue, but my dad paid for this course. I spent all these years preparing for it. It's a, it's a big deal. Right. And, um, and so I needed ammunition to really go to my dad, but <laughs> you know, that I could really pull from because you got to imagine going to your dad and saying, I don't, you know, I just don't feel like it. Right. Or I don't think this is for me. It's still a hard sell. Mm. Right. So I don't know. That's, that's what it was. Whatever, Whatever it was, that was exactly what I needed at that point and uh, just took action on it and completely reversed and, and altered altered where I was heading next. To go in what direction instead? Science. You know, I, I figured I, I like science. Um, and so for the next many years, I became a laboratory scientist. And, you know, I, I started working for the Center for Infectious Disease and Vaccinology. I worked on vaccines for third world countries, vaccines that you could eat instead of getting injected into you that were just as effective, if not more effective um, than what was currently available on the market and ones that, you know, you could really make for under a penny. And, you know, current vaccines, you have to keep them cold. You have to use needles, which um, can be a disaster sometimes based on who's using them. You need healthcare professionals, which they don't sometimes have. So, um, so that's what I that's what I started working on. I, I I transitioned into science and I really I really enjoyed it, you know. And that was my next career, right? Graduated with a degree in molecular bioscience and biotechnology. Um, worked as a laboratory scientist, you know, put together a thesis, um, and uh, yeah, became a lab rat essentially. <laughs> so, so that kind of job slash I guess it's a career. It, it sounds like you know it's all encompassing. You you're in the labs every day i'm assuming you're getting a reasonable salary you've got a clear path forward there's problems you want to solve did you feel all these things this strong motivation to in that direction well there's a very core element of making a difference right and i think that's kind of been very strong in me um all throughout the years being a doctor you make a difference with the, the patients you have scientists the stuff i was working on would really make a difference in the world and i think that was always kind of the thing that was really pulling me forward and uh, but yeah you know you work on you work on experiments i worked a lot of my time with plants you know i would say 90 percent of my time was spent with plants um but i was doing dna and protein works um you know stuff i was working on stuff that you can't see what are you uh, most proud of from from that period i'm what i'm most proud of for that period is 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 being able to um take a project that other people had not been able to, to solve and start working on it, rolled my sleeves up, and really figured out some things that uh, that didn't work, actually. <laughs> but I worked on something that everybody thought would work when it came to this, uh, this experiment. So what I was working on, okay, is I was taking genes from one plant, okay, and, uh, and I was injecting them into another plant, so that way it could produce a special type of protein that would, in fact, make a vaccine. So that's what I was working on. And it involves all these, like literally to every experiment, there's hundreds of steps and you're working with DNA and proteins. You can't see them. You, you don't, there's no way to visualize them except um, using certain, um, certain laboratory studies that you had to do use like gel, um, gel uh, electrophoresis, like polymerase chain reaction, all of that stuff. Um, so I, I, what I was at is trying to make a protein that correctly folded. We knew what the protein we had to make was to make a vaccine, but you have to be able to fold proteins. And what most people don't know is like you could produce a protein that that looks good, but if it's not if it's not put together in the right way inside the cell of the plant, you you really don't have anything, right? It's a complete waste of time. And what was the so, vaccine against? What was it for? It was hepatitis B vaccine. Okay. That's what I was so looking at. It's, it's serious stuff. Yeah, yeah, completely, completely, and very life changing. And uh, and you know, it's funny because I talk about how I 
escape the lab to became become an entrepreneur and they're like oh my god you're making such a difference like why 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 do that right um but yeah i was working on some really cool stuff but i here's the thing that i kept thinking in my head was i would love to own this lab rather than work in it and that was i thought that maybe that thought would go away but it it never did and it just kind of kept circling in in my brain so you want to own the lab rat, so not be a lab rat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, it was. Uh, you know, and, and you got to imagine that at this point, uh, I am a scientist, yes, but I'm a very much underpaid scientist, right? Because I'm just coming out of school, right? Um, you know, don't have my master's degree yet, so that's the next step. Um, so I looked at it as like I was still in science sweatshop, you know, mode. Mm-hmm. So, um, of course, the aspirations were huge, but. I was thinking that if I did everything right over the next decade or the next two decades, I would see a ton of things come come out of it. But there was also the chance that, you know, that nothing would. Right. Because I kept thinking there's all these scientists out there that have done great things. A lot of people have never even heard of them. Right. And there's been even more scientists beyond that that have done a lot of things, but never kind of proved their thesis or never got what they were working on out to the mainstream. And so, you know, with science, it, it just because you're a scientist doesn't mean you can go out there and change the world. And to me, it just seemed like such a long thing, like being in the lab every day for 20 years. And maybe by the end of that, you might have something. You might have something to show for it. It seemed like a long run to me. You better love it. That's for sure. If you're going to spend yes. time in a, a lab. So I'm getting from the, the tone in your voice here that you were not up for that, that next 20 years of your life being devoted to that. So did you start thinking about leaving or what happened? Well, uh, I here's what happened. Um, it's kind of like um, somebody says that uh, when preparation meets opportunity, like that's that's what luck is. Right. Mm. And so. Um, so a lot of times in my life, there's like these little things that happen that kind of steer me in the direction that I need to go in. And, um, they may seem small at first, but then they just create this like tidal wave in my life where I just like literally need to jump off and do it. And so somebody had actually, um, at this point, I'd kind of snuck into uh, the Dean's class for entrepreneurialism because I'm, I'm thinking, I don't know. I mean, I kind of want, I lo- love this, I love science, but I also want to do some big things with it. And when I snuck in there, like there was uh, one of the teachers, um, the, there's a guest lecturer and her name was Sharon Lecter. Sharon Lecter wrote, along with Robert Kiyosaki, wrote Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And so I was like, I've never heard of this book. Um, I need to know more about it. So I actually, I went and picked up a copy and then a boom, a light bulb went off immediately. And I was like, wow, I think I'm destined to be an entrepreneur. And, uh, and that was kind of like a game changer for me. And so at that point, I started doing all kinds of things. Um, I started working with the tech transfer office, which is the Uh, kind of the organization part of the university that would take scientific works patents and stuff like that and take it to the um take it to the entrepreneurial space license the technology right um to companies that could use it and spin it off and create companies and revenue and stuff like that so i started working with them um and then i started investigating real estate um so this is about 2007 um And real estate is, you know, we've just gone through this big surge. And so, you know, it was one of the things that was highly recommended in um, Rich Dad Poor Dad. They talk about it a lot. So I was like, I'll look at being in real estate. So I went out there and actually decided to get my real estate license. And so I got my real estate license, took one of those courses. It was like over, I think it was about two, three week courses, all accelerated. I was in school all day and took my, took this course, got hired at a company that did real estate investments and um, really learned from them, found a mentor there and did my first deal uh, within a week of getting my license, which um, they told me was pretty rare and I was pretty excited about. But, um, uh, you know, I, I had, I had started networking around to, to kind of meet people that were looking for investments. And uh, even while I was in I was in real estate school and so kind of lined everything up and just and that was my foray in there. Um, had you completely dropped yeah, science at this point, like just left everything uh, at this point? I was I was still working for the laboratory, but um my attention was definitely waning. At this point was kind of like the jumping off point for me because I had to make a change and I had to I had to do it. And I and I had, I had discussions with um uh with the uh, with with the head of the unit, right? That um 
uh, that I was working with and said, hey, look, this is what I'm doing. And this is kind of I'm kind of investigating these things over here. So um, so we worked together on that. And, you know, I bought myself some time to kind of figure out if, what I wanted to do. And, and at this point, right, once I started, once you do a deal and you're like, wow, this is great. This is like nothing I've ever experienced in the science world. Um, I think I found what I'm going to do. And so at that point, I made made the call. Yeah, I'm guessing you, you got the taste for money, but more too. And more importantly, perhaps control over your ability to make money, which is a, a huge thing. Yeah, I mean, that control is like, it's it's so important, right? Because it's based upon like your efforts and you can you can go out there. I mean, science, it science is so much based around efforts, but a lot of things you don't have control over. You don't have control over how things operate in a cell plant and all that stuff. And so it's, um, but it's the same thing as being an entrepreneur because it's still trial and error, but I can see things happen so much quickly, right? Being an entrepreneur, right? I do something, I see an end result. I say something, I see the end result, right? Mm. Um, and so it was, it, for me, it was a much faster laboratory for experimentation. Um, and you, you got to see, like, right before your very eyes, things happen. It was really incredible. Okay, so that experience led to you actually fully quitting the science world. I, I can't imagine what that conversation must have been like for you, you and your parents, you and your whoever you were working for in, in the lab, like, especially when they said or heard you're going to become a real estate agent. It's like, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think the term, like, you're nuts or crazy definitely came up, um, <laughs> you know, so... Yeah, I mean, it was tough because like, I mean, you grow up, I mean, all you seek is your parents approval, right? And um, uh, especially like, you know, I've been working with these scientists and they're very smart individuals. And, you know, the all the, like to them, science is the almighty God, right? And it's just, you know, it's so it's hard to deal with. But there's a lot to be said for conviction, because conviction I was so I was so convinced that this was my path that it didn't matter what my parents said, it didn't matter what scientists said, or my friends, right? I just knew this was what I had to do, right? And this was a new phenomenon for me because I grew up being very shy and um you know, my some of my first friends that I grew up with, like they det they they were the one that determined um, what we did, what we what we did for games or what we played or where we went and stuff like that. And I was just that like the beck and call, and and uh, that was my life, like up until probably college. And so being able to um, be the the captain of my own ship um, in that way it was it was a complete completely unique situ situation, kind of scary for me, but. I mean, I, I knew I couldn't do anything else but what I was doing right then. Now, you said you got into real estate in 2007, and I believe something happened to the real estate in 2008. So, <laughs> <laughs> yep. what happened to your, your new career? So... Okay, good. And and I'm I'm brand new. I have no idea what's going on. But what's about to happen in real estate, especially in Arizona, is one of the largest real estate crises and financial collapse that ever that happened this side of the uh, the millennium. And actually, this side of the hundred years has very, been very few um, occasions like this. And I'm brand new. Don't see it coming. Right. Get completely blindsided by all of this. Uh, and yet I've got such, you know, I'm, I'm just all about it, right? I haven't, you got to imagine, I've never seen cycles. I've never even studied cycles, right? I have, I've never seen cycles in entrepreneurialism because I wasn't an entrepreneur, neither in real estate. But I had, what I had was youth. I had youth and um, arrogance and ignorance, right, about everything that was going on. So I attacked it full bore and, uh, you know, did a number of things. I started, um, I started off as a realtor, decided I didn't want to be a realtor, right? Didn't want to be a babysitter for people trying to find their homes. Um, and uh, investment properties, right? But at those points, anything was an investment property. You just buy a property and they expect it to go up and then you'd sell it. Didn't matter what it was. Um, you know, even condos, like tons of people bought condos and they definitely turned out not to be investments and they were just rehab departments, right? So, um, but I got into raising capital for investments uh, for, a comp for an engineering company that was, um, what they would do is they would actually buy plots of land and they would prepare it for developments and then they'd sell it at that point, right? And so that's how they did. They were on the, um, they, they did surveys and all that stuff. So I got involved in that and raised, you know, three quarters of a million dollars in the span of a couple months. And I kind of found one of the things that I was really great at, which was presentations. And, um, you know, I learned, I learned one simple trick from, um, 
uh, a guy named Telman Knudsen. You probably remember, mm. you know Telman, right? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, which is list building. So that's what I did. I went out there and found people that were interested in investments and I put them into a database, constant contact, because that's what you used back in those days. And I started emailing them and I'd invite them, you know, I'd educate them and I'd invite them to little closed door sessions, um, you know, 12 people, 10, 12 people in a boardroom and uh, talk about real estate investments and give a presentation on it and then raise money. Right. And, um, you know, kind of book individual appointments with the investors and and see who's uh, interested in getting in. So that's that's what I learned. Right. Build a list. So I kept doing that, kept meeting people. And and that was the one thing that really actually made it for me at that time, which was really, really exciting. So I did that and then um, realized that I wanted to do my own investments. So I partnered up with somebody that's been doing cash flow investments um, in the Midwest for, for a while. And, you know, somebody that wanted to raise funds to do more. And so I teamed up with him and we started investing in, in you know, places like Ohio, um, little, little college town. Like how are you managing to raise funds? in a, like 2008, 2009, 2010, there was no liquidation of capital then. It was like no one was lending because it was too risky. So it sounds like you're doing the actual, you know, the impossible thing to do in that time of, of the history. Yeah. So this is 2000, um, this is 2007, early 2008. And I was I was, you know, it was straight up 401ks. I was helping people do self-directed IRAs, 401ks, taking their retirement funds and do this, right? Um, so this is just before the GFC happened. Yes, this is this is right up until you got to imagine. I'm going right up until like D Day, you know. Right. So, um, so you're and, raising money just as it's the hit, like the literal last run of everyone having this fever pitch, you know, throwing money at anything kind of scenario. Oh yeah, oh, yeah absolutely. And I'm not alone. Like I, this is definitely, you know, um, some people see it happening. Every you got to imagine everybody's caught up in and greed right at this point right and they're just you know they they've seen it happen people that are very smart people like i've talked to people that are you know very smart um been entrepreneurs for a long time that literally i mean they went into bankruptcy because they bought up so many properties right because they thought there'd never be an end to this right like the heyday it's going to keep going it's going to keep going right and they just they doubled down they tripled down and then lost their stakes and this was going along, you know, not just me, but people that have been around, I mean, in the industry for 20, 20 years or 30 years. So, um, so yeah, kind of uh, doing, doing all of this stuff, not having an inclination of what's going on, right? Um, but I mean, at this point, like we're raising, you got to imagine, so I'm doing cash flow properties in the Midwest, properties cost $30,000, right? And um, you can cash flow them get five to seven hundred sometimes nine hundred dollars a month right and that covers the mortgage plus pro you get profits and you just you know so we just started buying up all these properties right so you know i'm um i'm at this point right i'm like 22 and i'm buying my first i'm buying you know i'm buying my first uh properties which is pretty exciting you know and uh, I don't know very many 22 year olds that can say that that's, you know, they bought their first property, investment properties at that age. And so here I am. But what ended up happening was something that I couldn't have predicted because I wasn't prepared for it, both in terms of the real estate market, but also what I had entered into without knowing it was a partnership that was not destined to be. And, um, you know, so all kinds of things happened, um, you know, um, uh, basically I got, I got booted out of the company, um, by my partner and, you know, I just didn't see it coming. And what had happened was, is that, um, he used a lot of my connections that I was bringing to him and started doing deals with those individuals right on the side. And, and then, you know, at that point, and I didn't know this, but you know, he, he's married at the time, but, um, basically been divorced numerous times. But I didn't know what to expect from partnerships. But what I realized in this very moment is that if you're in a partnership, you got to be in partnerships with people that actually know how to maintain relationships. And um, I just didn't, you know, I didn't know that. But like probably somebody that's prob that, that that's on their third marriage is probably not the best person to maintain long term relationships mm. at that point. And so at this point, I'm, I worked so hard to put this company together, raised a ton of investor money, right? Done my own deals in real estate. A, the real estate market is falling to pieces and B, I just really got shafted by my business partner. And so 
kind of at the lowest of lows, not really knowing where to go next. When you say you got shafted, is this kind of like a, maybe a silver lining? Because I can only imagine if you were the co-founder of an investment company that had taken a lot of people's money to then invest in property, then all the property values just crash. So all the investment investors are upset. Now that you're no longer co-owner or the company, in some ways you kind of dodged a bullet. Is that accurate to say? Uh, yes and no. I mean, um, at this point, you know, I'd done a lot of different deals, right? Because, you know, I'd done one with the real estate firm that went out and, and um, you know, they, they'd done a lot. I didn't know this at the time, but like, you know, they completely couldn't return the monies that they got from investors. So I'm, I'm dealing with relationships that are broken that I have to go and, you know, and, and there's no way to mend it at this point, right? There's still, um, the Department of Justice is actually still they're taking them to trial and, and all kinds of stuff, right? So this was from before my real estate investment company that I started, which what I thought was like a legit firm. But what happened is they just get, got in over their heads and they, they just couldn't like give the investor money back. And so, um, so yeah, I'm dealing with that framework and I'm also dealing with, um, you know, investors, the investors that did the cash flow properties, there wasn't, that was actually a good deal because you know, you got to imagine these properties were in good towns, college towns, stable economy, um, uh, for the most part, things weren't happening. Um, we got them really cheap. So there was, it, it's not like we were planning buying them with the purpose of flipping them. So, so that part of it was okay. Right. But I'm still dealing with relationships, you know, um, that are going sideways at this point. So yeah, it, it was a blessing in disguise. What I didn't realize at that point was I really, although I was in real estate, I liked what I was doing. Um, I, I wanted something else, right? Like I totally was looking for something else. And this kind of happens just like it happened when I was looking to be a doctor and then I'm not a doctor and I'm a scientist. Now I'm looking for other things. It's well, just... I'm seeing a pattern here to be honest, Corey. It's like, and it's amazing how much you change in, in uh, like we haven't even hit, I think you're 25 years old yet. And you've gone from gymnast to doctor to biomedical laboratory rat to real estate investor slash, uh, I guess, fundraiser. And this is, and now you're leaving that as well, right? <laughs> yeah. So a lot had happened in a very short amount of time, but um, there's a lot to be said for approaching things very aggressively, right? Okay. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> I can't really imagine what your parents were thinking at this point. So. Oh my gosh. Well, what they're seeing is me change completely. My mom actually told me because at this point I'm trying to learn how to sell, right? I went from being the shyest kid in high school to really trying to figure out how to be an entrepreneur. And actually it turns out being an entrepreneur, one of the skills that you really need is salesmanship. And, and they were like, I don't know if I like this part of you. So, <laughs> so they're, you know, so they're, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. So yeah, I mean, it's, and you know, for the most part, I just kept my head down. I mean, you know, um, I did, I really kind of didn't keep in contact with a lot of people. Like when I, I just put my head down and worked, you know, I, um, I didn't really socialize too much. I just, I just cranked out business, which is really what I wanted to do. But you know, I figured, I don't really want to have to explain things to people. So I'm just going to maintain distance from folks, right? Um, as I go through this. And uh, yeah, and then and so, so here I was, right? Um, without a company, um, worked really hard to to do all that stuff. You know, I've got I've got properties, I've got a little bit of money coming in. But I'm I'm really kind of having a, a a breakdown because I have no idea what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Okay, so options. <laughs> did you see <laughs> any, any kind of pathway, or how did you solve this problem? So here's how I solved it. I um, I at this point realized that what I loved was marketing. I loved the marketing aspect of what I was doing. That's what I really loved. I didn't love real estate. I loved marketing, and so I was like, well. Why don't I start? Why don't I start doing marketing, right? And so, um, so I do that. So I kind of, kind of like um, start seeing if I could get clients. At this point, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm running out of cash, right? And, um, and so I'm like, well, let me go get hired. I'll do some consulting on the side. I get hired by this company. They have me do like negotiations um, in the cost containment space. It's in the medical space, right? And I'm just, I'm sitting there and uh, I'm working for this company. And then I, I was like, well, I'm going to start the market. They didn't have a marketing division, right? <laughs> and I was like, I'm going to start the marketing division. So I go to the, the owner and I say, hey, look, here's, and by the way, I'd bought in like two courses on marketing. So I figured I knew, <laughs> I figured I was a genius at marketing at this point. So <laughs> right. I was like, hey, 
Um, I'm going to start a marketing division here because here's what I think I can do. So I made a presentation. Turns out I was really great at presentations, right? More than anything. Right. I think. <laughs> it's the one, one thing you keep saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so like, he's like, okay, we'll give it a shot. So I put everything together. Um, I start the marketing division. So put all this collateral together, put videos together, put flyers together. They didn't even have flyers. Can you believe that? So they're like multi-million dollar company. They don't even have um, flyers and handouts. So I, I, I put everything together. And then I convinced, um, then at this point, I read 4-Hour Workweek. Now, this is a game-changing book for me. I, I read this book and I was like, holy crap, there's so much to life. I mean, there's outsourcing. I could do this. So what I do is I... I go to my, my, the CEO of the company and said, you know, I think, I think I would get so much more done if I worked at home and um, kind of made my case for it. And they said, OK, let's give it a shot. And so I, I worked from home and I outsourced my entire position <laughs> to <laughs> the India and the Philippines. <laughs> so, That's awesome. And, and yeah, pretty incredible. So what exactly uh, was the, the, the tasks you outsourced? Well, um, marketing creation, right? Um, so I outsource like reach out. Um, I outsource like the creation of marketing materials. Um, was working on a blog. Outsourced that. Was working on videos that we would send. Was you know doing email marketing, right? So I was I was outsourcing. I did most of the writing for it, but outsourcing like um, you know the actual implementation, sending out messages to the the email database and all that stuff. So um, so that's what I was doing. And um, how much like did it? take you know you obviously had to use some of your salary to cover the outsourcing did you get to keep 75 percent of your salary and, and do nothing was that sort of the scenario you found yourself in i found myself 60 percent. i got to keep and i spent a lot of time that summer at the pool <laughs> okay. thinking thinking i was the coolest person that ever existed so <laughs> for figuring this out does right your, does your ex-boss know about this <laughs> Uh, I don't believe so. Uh, he doesn't um, listen to the podcast. <laughs> right. Yes, totally. Um, totally. I mean, I did a ton of great stuff for him. But yeah, this was, I was a totally, you know, looking back on it, I realized I was just a horrible employee. Like, you know, <laughs> I was mostly because I I don't think I was ever destined to be one, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, so that's that's what happened. So what ended up happening, um, they loved what I did so much that, um, th so they brought in like a new, like, chief operations officer and they love what I did so much that they actually said, well, hey, why don't this, there's something to this marketing thing. Let's hire an actual marketing firm. So they hired a marketing agency, right? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden my job was completely deleted. You know, <laughs> there's no need for it because they had hired somebody else to do it. And it was interesting. So I like, I didn't know what, they, they actually brought me in and they said, look, we don't have a need for you, so we're gonna let you go. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, I was like so crushed. And but at this point, they had started bringing me back into the office and I hated it. And I knew like for me, I needed to do something different anyway. Literally that day, I think I had a uh, I had a, um, a an interview lined up with an actual marketing agency. Right. And um, and this happened. So I like I was like, OK, well, I got my suit on and I went over. I li like, literally walked a couple blocks because it was actually, you know, I I, um, I found this marketing agency because I take walks during my breaks sometimes. And so I uh, found this agency and, you know, just went in for an interview that same day, you know, after I had kind of got over the oh, my God, what the hell happened? I'd never been fired from a job in my entire life. So right. this is kind of a big for me. Um, and but after walking away from that interview and walking away from the experience of being let go because they outsourced my entire position to an agency, I was like, which is kind of what? ironic since you outsourced the job itself. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I know. It's totally ironic, right? It's just so. Um, but I made the determination at that very moment. I was like, I'm never I'm never going to work for anybody else again. Right. I'm just going to make this work. And why don't I just become the agency? And that's what I decided to do at that very moment. So let's put this into context. Uh, 2000, what, 10, 11, 12? Uh, this is um, 2009, actually. Okay. So this so, is the first time you've fully become an entrepreneur and you're thinking you're going to be a marketing agency. Correct. Correct, okay. correct, correct. So, so how'd it go? Uh, so here's what happened. I, I had no choice. I went and got my first client um, within a matter of weeks. How? And I, well, I, I did networking. I just kind of found somebody. He, he actually was in the real estate space. His name was John Park and he did self-directed IRAs. And I just sat down with him and said, well, look, you know, 
here's what I see that are, you know, are some things that you could do. And I just kind of, you know, walked him through and said, look, if you do this, this and this is what can happen. And so sat down and he's like, okay. And it was, he was, and I was like, yeah, I could help you with that. And he's like, okay, how much? And he threw out a price and I was like, yeah. Um, and, and so we just, we started working half down and then half in 30 days when I finished. And that was my first agency client, um, at that very moment. So I was really, I was super thrilled. Um, and then what happened was something that kind of shifted everything, right? Because I love the marketing. I was, I was getting a client, but I also realized I had a lot to learn from sales about sales. And through these many years, I'd always kind of, I mean, there's this guy named Ira Rosen. I met him and such a smart guy. Been an entrepreneur at this point for over 40 years, uh, owned medical weight loss clinics back in the Midwest, owned real estate, uh, or excuse me, owned uh, automotive dealerships and sold them, moved out here um, to Scottsdale. And how did, you, I just, how did you meet him? I met him through his daughter, Kina, who was, um, who's who became a good friend of mine she i met her at toastmasters um i did toastmasters like one time and then i dropped out but i did meet her and she introduced me at a networking event to him and so that kind of started a really cool friendship because at the time he is doing he's semi-retired not doing much but he's helping his brother who owns who runs the biggest hard money seminars uh in the united states and so uh so i met him at, hard uh, money seminars yeah, hard money seminars is people that uh, provide loans for money, higher interest rate because they're they don't do it based uh, on uh, collateral, right? They, you know, there's people um, struggling situations, bad credit, that sort of thing. Well, maybe bad credit, but just deals where you need fast money until you can get financing in place, right? right. So, um, so you know, eighteen percent was was pretty standard. So. So this, there was an entire industry, and so he was helping his brother run these events. So I met him, and he invited me to this event. I was at that point still in real estate, so I figured, yeah, why not? You know, it seems like there might be something there. And so, yeah, I went, and it was, you know, you got to imagine. I, was, I met him at this time. I was just getting out of college. I, the, the event itself cost $500. Um, at this point, I hadn't done as many deals, so five hundred dollars are still using my credit card to kind of fund my fled, you know, my my growing real estate, uh, what I considered an empire, but at that point was almost nothing. But uh, so I went, and we just developed a friendship. And since since then, I'd always kind of um, um, partnered. I, I'd always kind of here's what happened. Like he loves running. He's run over a hundred thousand miles in his life point, uh, lifetime. And I thought, wow, this is great. And I was like, I just want to spend time with the guy. So I would actually spend time running with him on the weekends. And he was preparing for marathons. And so I thought, I'll prepare for a marathon with him. And that's how we developed the relationship. Just super sharp guy. But I wanted to learn what he knew about sales. So it's an interesting uh, decision to make. I don't think a lot of people, because he must be, what, three or four times your age? Uh, would that be right? Uh, easily, yeah. Like, um, yeah, two and a half times my age. Right. Yep. So, you know, you're making a conscious decision to, I guess, actively seek out a mentor without, you know, even sure why. You just you want you said sales, but, you know, it was more like I just feel like this guy knows something and I want to spend time with him. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And along the way, like he held his own entrepreneurial boot camp in, you know, in Skysong. It's one of the centers for innovation here, part of Arizona State University. So he held his own event and I helped him produce it, right? I helped him do the PowerPoint because at this point, he really doesn't know how to use a computer um, pretty much at all. And he had a computer once that his wife bought him at one of his previous businesses, never used it, right? So um, old, old so, school entrepreneur, old school entrepreneur. So I'm teaching him a lot about, about, you know, like new things, new technologies, autoresponders, websites, that kind of stuff. So I'm teaching him about that. And so, you know, I'm helping him with that in his event. And then it comes down, I've got a meeting um, with the largest dental company in the Southwest. And so I'm like, I, you know, come help me close this deal because it was such a big deal. I thought for sure that I was definitely going to mess it up somehow. So, um, so he comes and, and just, you know, and everything just works out so well. We're like, well, why don't we do this more? Right. And so we meet up. It's 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 uh, we meet up at this place called Heart Attack Grill. Right. Um, you know, write down some plans. Right. It's mm -hmm. it's it, literally the day is February 14th, which everybody knows that is Valentine's Day. Um, and that's the day we map some stuff out on a napkin and we said, yeah, let's do this. And we literally start a company right that day. Right. And uh, so when you say that, like what it, what did you like? How do you even get a direction for a company? What were you thinking? 
marketing agency, right? Marketing. So that was kind of what we started because um, that's what we were doing at that point. Like he was down to help me sell these projects and I was help, down to help fulfill. So um, so that's what, so we started our marketing agency and we're trying to figure out what products we should sell and offer, right? Because there's like SEO, do you offer like funnels? And there's, I was like, well, let's, let's do video because video is hot. I've always been kind of one, you know, like in science, you always got to be looking ahead. And I'm always looking ahead at that point. Video was not used, but becoming but I knew it was going to be a major thing this is 2009 Mm -hmm. right and so we start a company where we offer uh, we, we offer, we call it the database multiplier, but basically we offered a series of video autoresponders that, you know, we'd go out and film people, create 10 videos, put them into autoresponders to help them build relationships with their followings, with people. They, oh, yes, that's yeah, ahead of your time. Yeah. I mean, completely. I mean, at this point, a Weber is just basically, you know, they're getting going. Right. And, um, and we actually use AWeber as our first autoresponder, and we mm-hmm. promptly get kicked out of AWeber because they, they're like, you can't really opt people into this. Because we used to have clients that would go out networking, meet people, and then enter da- emails into there and start them on a like a drip sequence using video, right? right. So and they're like, mm, no, we're just going to dissolve this account. So <laughs> okay. they, they didn't like the fact that you were manually adding people to no, negative. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely okay. not. So, um, so we have to go and figure out another software. So we actually license a software, um, that's out there to do this where they were a little bit more lenient for this fact. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, and then we're like, uh, you know, it was very expensive. We're like, for this money, we could just build our own. And so that's when we start building our own first SaaS. Mm-hmm. Our first SaaS product, which is, is a video email, video text message software, right? And we built it so you could upload videos. It'll mobile encode it. You could watch these videos on a cell phone. And these are back in the days when only Blackberries were the only phone with data on it. Wow. So how do you even start that? I can imagine that would have cost tens of thousands of dollars to create. And it did. It did. <laughs> and uh, we, we were bootstrapping it, actually. And we worked a deal where we'd only pay so much a month, right? So we kind of financed it with the programmer, right? Because I knew the programmer going through school. He was actually a, a friend of a friend. And so we worked out this deal. And uh, yeah, we started a software called the Mojo Matrix. And it was pretty... It was fun, but it was completely bleeding edge. Like not even not even cutting edge, bleeding edge. I mean, we were mobile encoding videos before Google and YouTube was, right? And at this point, they're just getting rolling as well. So, um, so and what I had found out is that it was a little bit too early for people for video. But that didn't stop us because we went out <laughs> to the market and sold the crap out of this, right? And we sold it through webinars. And... Um, but I still remember our first webinar, I, and I thought, we're like, oh, we're going to, you know, because at this point, we built up a database, right? Still list building, still focused on that. And we're like, we're going to go out and make enough money to kind of buy an island, right? Because we're, <laughs> our, so, so we conducted our first webinar, and then we, we dropped the price point, had them go to a link, and we're waiting for the orders to come in. I'm like hitting refresh, and I'm like, God, this suddenly must be broken. So I keep hitting refresh, go check the servers, go check everything. And I'm like, oh, I don't think we did any sales. It's like, you know, it's like our worst nightmare. And so... At this point, um, we're like, huh? I don't know what we did. So let's let's do it something else, and let's do you know let's figure it out. And so did our next webinar, and we so we got one client, right? One client. You know, we're selling things for four ninety seven price point, and then what, you what know. exactly are you selling? So it's like a four ninety seven uh, video software. Software yeah. that does what exactly? It does videos. You can upload videos, create emails uh, out of it. But what we focus on is creating video emails. So you would upload like three, five, 10 videos, create a series of emails, put them in order and create a drip campaign out of video, right? So you're kind of doing email autoresponding plus multimedia management when you create yes. the emails. Yes. Now what also would happen is we also created a text message platform so you could actually put a drip campaign together of email or text messaging that you could send to people. You guys are ahead of your time. I'll give you that. But it must have been a, a potentially a hard sell because it would have been brand new. People would have been like... Uh, like I've never seen this before. It should have been amazing, I guess. But maybe, like you said, you were too early? Yes, completely too early. I mean, it was literally, you know, it's like talking about crypto, you know, like a few years ago. Like right. people are just like, what? What are you talking about? You know, it's uh, it was way too early. And in fact, when we explained it to people, it got more confused the more we talked about it. So... Right. 
Um, so yeah, it was completely bleeding edge. And you got to imagine, you know, this, it, it all worked really great. We got a lot of clients, but we had to really, we had to struggle uphill against two different things. Number one, bandwidth. Bandwidth still at this point is not the greatest. So we're mobile encoding videos, right? And we've got a great encoder that actually can, you know, plays pretty seamlessly, but still bandwidth. So m- mm. most people are not, um, bandwidth still, you know, we're barely past the AOL days, right? Mm. So, um, I can see, so yeah, like I guess creating a video and streaming a video would have been two very difficult things to do back then. Yes, exactly. So, so luckily we had some really great encoders, um, that, uh, that we were using and that, 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 that was kind of like our saving grace because we actually had very fast processing speed, probably some of the best in the industry. And um, But we're dealing with the other major hurdle, which I didn't see coming, is that people at this point do not want to shoot video, right? They want to be on video. It's really weird for them, right? I mean, it's not like now where everybody knows that, hey, I got to be on video, mm-hmm. right? Um, and that they actually want to. At this point, we're literally doing all the education necessary to get them excited about this opportunity, Right. That net have never existed before. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, video had always been the, the for the networks, the stations. Right. They were the ones that were offering it. You could only, you know, that's what that's where video was. Now it's being brought into the hands of the individual. They everybody was able to produce videos. And really, frankly, like our first videos that we ever produced were done on a flip camera. The little flip camera. I don't know if you remember that yeah, thing. Yeah. That was huge. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Super huge. So. That's what we did. So we were at the very early days of all of this. And, um, you know, we worked uphill and uphill and uphill and uphill to really and beat everybody over the head with the power of video. And it's still at this point, um, what is it, 2011, 2010, right? And we just got completely burned out on this whole thing, right? (laughs) Because, um, and here's what I, going back, here's what I should have done. And this is what would have been incredible if I would have just focused on creating an email platform rather than focusing on video and all these elements that people were used to. If I just worked on educating people as far as email, mm-hmm. it would have been a much better play because that's what we had. We had a really great email program that was also stacked with SMS and also video. If I would have just stripped those things out and produced a, just an email platform, oh my God, it would have been incredible. Mm-hmm. But um, so when, but you anyway. say, when you say we, this is still you and your computer illiterate um, business partner? <laughs> <laughs> that- right. So at this point, can now use Gmail. Okay. Right. Um, and do some of that. Now, now he can do email. But yes, so very got, much. You've got a partner who barely uses technology, and you're building a business which is essentially cutting edge technology for the time. Correct. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's genius or really stupid. <laughs> uh, at the point at, when I first started, when we first started, it was genius. But <laughs> once we got going, we realized it was insane, very insane. Okay. So, so how did how did you survive then? I mean, assuming you're still trying to make a living from all of this and you know pay your bills and so forth, right? Yeah, well, I'll tell you what was a saving grace. Everything was built on recurring revenue, right? Everything. So we would actually produce videos for people and charge like, I don't know, $6,000 for the year and actually do done for you, right? So we would do done for you versions. And so we'd pay, we'd, we'd finance it for 500 bucks a month, right? And then also we're building recurring membership because everybody's paying us one ninety uh, either $97 a month or 197 And so we're building recurring revenue. And that was the one thing that always kept that saved our business not only saved it but made sure we stayed in business but also that we you know we could have a business to grow and thrive and that was respectable yeah. right so we'd always focused on recurring revenue that was the one saving grace that we'd always focus on because i came from the real estate world where the recurring passive income was like the number one thing and so i that we had institutionalized and made that part of the very fa- fabric of our company. We didn't do anything unless it came with recurring revenue. Right. So you weren't buying an island, but even though you were getting a trickle of clients, at least they were recurring income customers. Completely. Okay. Correct. Yep. So how did you go from that to today? You have the seven-figure business that does way more than just that. So was it just a case of building this kind of Frankenstein's monster of, of things people wanted, or how did it grow? <laughs> so at this point, we're getting burned out with video because you know, it's too early. Like if we had waited a few, few more years, like we would have just crushed it. Um, so what happened was, is, you know, we actually kind of packaged it up and that company got acquired, right? So the Mojo Matrix, that software got acquired and we're like, okay, this is cool. Um, it wasn't, you know, obviously when you get into business, you hope for an acquisition that's like crazy big, 
right? Like, you know, very much Google-esque. That didn't happen, but it was enough to where we could kind of like say, okay, breathe a little bit and figure out where we wanted to go next. Okay. And, and it was, a, I, I, you know, I realize you've got a long story here already over an hour, but I'm, I'm curious because whenever you sell a business, there's the process of selling it, there's the process of finding a buyer. Did that happen deliberately or did someone just come knocking on your door looking to acquire you? Completely by accident. Okay. Com- yeah, completely by accident. So, and actually... Um, what had happened is that deal was brought to us by the programmer itself, the person who had actually programmed it. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so um, so we kind of, um, you know, we struck a, an agreement all together and uh, and made it happen. So, so you, were, you, were, you were clean then. You, you were open door. Like you didn't have any other things going on. You'd got enough money to survive for a while from the exit. So you had breathing room, but you had nothing on your plate in terms of businesses at that point. Well, we still have our agency, right? So, um, we still, we still produce videos. So even though the the software got acquired, we still had a video production company, but we're kind of, we're done with that as well. Mentally exhausted from running a production company. Keep in mind, I don't have any video background, like none. You use the contract. This is all Tim Ferriss's fault with the four hour work week, right? Because you (laughs) you think everything is possible because you can hire a contractor to do it. Right. Yeah, completely. And, you know, I figure I walk into the studio one day, I've got like a room full of 20 people and I figured this is the worst thing because I'm an adult babysitter for all these you know <laughs> all these people and um th- we decided we got to do something else and i go to my partner and say look i don't want to produce any more videos right and and so we kind of wind that down as well and but we're looking for the next thing and so one of the things that all our clients always said is like look your product is great you have this autoresponder it's phenomenal but i need more people to put into it so how do i need more leads so how do we do that and we hadn't been able to resolve that or even take a look at that we were too busy running the business so we're like well let's figure that piece out because that seemed to be something people wanted and so we looked and we looked at all the things we'd done for lead gen and then we looked at linkedin which we hadn't really quite tapped into yet and said let's let's see what's in linkedin right and Um, I just remember like those early days, I was like, Hey, Hey, Ira, look, look what we can do here. Right. And, um, and that was uh, like, uh, what I didn't know at this time is that was going to be like the biggest thing for us is diving into LinkedIn, the biggest boon to anything we've ever done. Um, and the focus for us for the next five years. I still find it amazing that, you know, you're, you're sitting and talking to your business partner, Ira, look at LinkedIn where he's, uh, you know, a guy who was, like you said, in, into bricks and mortar businesses most of his life and is uh, basically playing catch up with tech through you in a lot of ways. Uh, it's not what I would call the typical tech co-founder i can understand the wisdom of of an entrepreneur with proven background and and, you know the the mindset advice you would have got and the uh, maybe the connections advice but it still seems like a weird fit like normally you'd have like a a tech person as your co-founder or something like that you know um but take us forward so linkedin is your you you are realizing is this potential new platform for you to build something around is that right yeah so i um what I realized is that like LinkedIn is like kind of like this. And at this point, we spent a ton of money on Facebook. I not really realized a lot of results. But um, we started diving into it and just kind of exploring. Like how could we actually generate interest and in, in all that stuff? So we spent tons of money just like on on finding experts in LinkedIn, right? And what do you mean? Like you spent money to do that? What did you do? We well, first of all, we hired we hired LinkedIn experts. We hired somebody um, that was kind of like the go to person in LinkedIn at that point, and had them run some campaigns for us. That wasn't Lewis really, Howes back then, was it? No, no. I mean, Lewis Howes was kind of like the other big name. He he he'd done a course on LinkedIn. And uh, no, there's another guy named Nathan Kiebman who um, who's still in LinkedIn to this day. And um, so we did some early stuff, and this was some expensive programs. I mean, they cost us like thirty five, you know, thirty five hundred a month, five grand a month. I mean, you know, and and he's running campaigns for us, and so that kind of does some some stuff. But we're you know we're still not sure about it. So we just go and hire some some people, and we just have everybody every day. We've got like different consultants, like um, contractors that are going into LinkedIn and just messaging people, right? Just taking formulas that I'll come up with, and then just using them and seeing what happens. This is to get clients for your agency still, or because I thought you closed down a lot of that. Yeah, we 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 did, 
Um, but we were still doing some other stuff. We were doing consulting on the side. So, so when you say consulting, um, like like sales consulting or, or what? Yeah, just consulting on running agencies, okay. right? Running businesses. So, um, so we're doing consulting and that's what we're doing. We were looking at this point to meet people that, you know, that we could sell consulting services to. When, so, just to clarify, because I, I, whenever people say consulting services, it, it's like an amorphous phrase. It doesn't mean anything by itself, right? So what exactly were you getting on the phone and doing you know, marketing advice to these people, t- teaching them how to build a funnel, or were you doing something for them? What was consulting? So basically, we'd sell a package of five or fifteen thousand mm-hmm. um, dollars, and sometimes, yeah, sometimes we had a client that we charged sixty thousand dollars for a done for you funnel, but we'd like do thirty thousand dollar things where we'd build them out on a funnel that we used in our video business, right? So, um, but there was a couple layers. Like we'd have five thousand dollars where they could, you know, they could fly in and we'd spend a day with them and we'd map out some funnels and and you know teach them about you know how to how to run the business we had that we had um we had some funnels that we sold for thirty thousand dollars right and uh so we were that's what we were selling and people this was like what was this this was 2000 probably 13 or something like that 2012 through 2013 we were probably selling some of the first funnels that ever really anybody sold this was way before click funnels or anything like that you know right but you were doing it for them you weren't exactly you had no software or anything like that so correct but correct, i can correct. see if you can land a five thousand dollar client you can afford to spend a bit of money on these basically prospecting experts who are diving into linkedin to try and find customers for your consultancy that's that's what you were doing basically right yes exactly okay. Okay. so so that's what we were doing and then i I was like, well, this is working really great with LinkedIn. I was like, but we got all these people. And I was kind of at this point a little bit, I had so many people in the video production business. I was like, I want to get away from that. So I want to make this easier. So let's start working on a software. And so we produced the software. It was the first of its, you know, first of its kind. It was a LinkedIn software that went into LinkedIn and helped you automatically find and prospect uh, people that um, you could have and engage conversations with. And then we started using LinkedIn to reach out to people about this particular software and say, hey, you know, would you like to buy it? And, um, and so that's that's kind of how we got started offering LinkedIn services, really, so the, a number of years ago. It sounds to me just kind of based on everything you said for the from the point you started your agency which is a number of years a lot of the results you've gotten you've built software multiple times you've built full-blown video creation teams you've built funnels it sounds like one of the things that you have become very good at over the years is actually hiring outsourcers finding talented people to build software to you know do something else is that true because you you're doing a lot and you haven't mentioned an employee or another co-founder besides Ira. So, and Ira's not the one who's going to be building software for you. I know that for sure. So, you know, <laughs> I'm guessing it's it's just you're, you're, you're really good at finding you know, in, in Indian-based contractors or Ukrainian or, or what are you doing? Well, at the, you know, so yes, I'm really good at like our first um, employee was like, a, a, uh, I believe, a Filipino uh, worker, right? So, um, but, but, you know, after that, I mean, we hired videographers, we had videographers, we had video editors, we had like a whole suite of people, we had people that would actually do done for you, um, campaign implementations, we had people that would write copy. So we had a full suite of people, they right? Were, so yes, yeah, they were locals, like in your hometown, um, a lot of them were locals, right? Um, at that point, right? This is why, like, you know, we had an office, we had a ton of people in there. Yeah. And there were a lot of locals, you but we also had some outsourced then. people. Yeah, I had a huge payroll and I really wanted to get away from it, um, you know, and and so I wanted to go like leaner when it came to LinkedIn stuff. So LinkedIn, we did, you know, we were really good at partners. When it came to software, we didn't do outsourcing, um, so to speak, where we found like somebody in the India or Philippines to code for us. We would actually find partners that would actually code um, for us. And we do deals with them where we would give them a share of the revenue based on, you know, the amount of customers we brought in. Right. So how do you pitch that? Because a lot of people would be interested in getting free software made, but, you know, convincing a software firm to say you won't make any money unless we bring in sales. Right. And that's a pretty precarious offer if you have no credibility. Right. Yeah. I mean, but we have credibility at this point because we're well, we're, we're known in the industry. Uh, we're known as the video guys at this point. What was the um, name although of that, that company? Uh, Mojo Video Marketing was the original company that we started um, back in 2009. Okay. Right. So Mojo Video Marketing and um, and so now 
we got to know that like uh, I'm very me and also my business partner were very good at presentations. So <laughs> you just <laughs> you know it's just like and bring on clients. You got to paint the picture and let the, them. Yeah. You know. The takeaway from this podcast will be get good at presentations because that's the key to everything. I think. I think about it. I mean, look, Steve Jobs. Yeah, Steve Jobs presentations. That's how he did. I don't know if you ever watched Steve, you know the the Steve Jobs movie, but like he controlled every fiber of his presentation about the products he came out with. Right. Um, in that respect, like. Anybody who raises capital ever presentations, you know, anybody, any startup who's ever successfully raised money, they did a, a presentation that kind of spoke to the investor, mm-hmm. right? And, um, you know, every, anybody who's ever brought on a client, because you presented it in a way that made it alluring and attractive to them and they could see what was in it for them. So, I mean, such is, Maybe such is life. you could illustrate that by this software. So your first attempt at LinkedIn software to audit, to, to create something to sell, how did that come about? Did you have to do a presentation to various software firms to convince them to become partners with you? No, at this point, I, I kind of stumble across a person that's on the same wave path as our as us, right? Okay. Um, almost like a LinkedIn. co-founder then. Yeah, almost like it, but um, not quite, right? So just, um, you know, yeah, we the programming co-founder of, of sorts, right? If you could, if you'd say that. So um, yeah, and so that's, and that's what we've done a lot of because, you know, we like to focus on marketing. Right. Because that's what I love. And and we like to have other people worry on the details, you know, and uh, that's just what we've done over and over again. So so here we are coming out with this product and we just go go gung ho in the in the arena and uh, probably come at this point, one of the foremost experts on LinkedIn um, and and what to do in LinkedIn, because there's a lot of people that train LinkedIn, but most people like some people don't actually do it for themselves, right? So let's just pause for a second and just in five minutes, because we're actually running out of time for you to get off somewhere. And I want to, you know, get to the end of your story. But we have to at least spend five minutes on what does it take and for today's environment to use LinkedIn for marketing? Like what is the the smart way? It all comes down to a couple of very important things. There's a three-step formula for success when it comes to LinkedIn. Now, a lot of people think it has a lot to do with like, oh, my profile and stuff. And your profile is very important, but the money, the money maker is actually different than most m- most people think. And it comes down to these three steps. And I hope everybody writes them down and uses them. But the first thing you want to do is connect, right? You want to connect and find your perfect prospect. A lot of people in their LinkedIn profiles, they have, you know, they have their friends, they have their colleagues, their college buddies, um, they have their competition, but they do not have prospects, right? A lot of people think re- LinkedIn is just a resume posting site. And it used to be, but these days I look at it as a giant lead warehouse. And in fact, LinkedIn itself makes most of its money from paid accounts that help you connect and message and inter- engage with with other folks on the platform. So the first thing is to connect um, with folks on the platform, right? Once you connect to them, and by the way, everybody connects to people they don't know. Almost everybody does it. So it's just it's just a thing. It's so easy to, to accept a connection. They're 25 times likelier to actually connect with you than opt into your database, right? Just because you just got to hit a button. So the first thing you want to do is hone in who you're looking for and connect with them. And then after that, you want to engage with them, right? You want to send them a message. You want to see what they're up to. You want to really um, get into their world. But Get attention, right? And um, and really, the next thing is monetize, which is get them, get them, get on meeting going, right? Take it off LinkedIn. Most people don't realize that you know LinkedIn is a great platform, but um, the longer you keep a contact on there, the less likely an end result is going to happen. You want to get them on the phone, you want to get them engaged, you want to be talking about them, building the relationship, because that's where all the money made, is, is. That's where all the money is made. Mm-hmm. So just to break it down, it's connect, message, monetize. That is the formula that works, right? So it, and it doesn't sound to me that much of that is really LinkedIn itself. LinkedIn is a great uh, tool for digging into and finding people in certain industries who might be good target customers for what you sell, right? So that's the, the kind of the first skill you learn is how to use LinkedIn as a research tool to find good people. And correct me if I'm wrong, that possibly is where something like the software you you built and what your company does today is is all about correct yeah we are we're really um linkedin is just a conduit right it's it's just the it's just the site that's the portal that gets you the introduction to the person you want to talk to and that's what it should be used for right and and there's 500 million people on linkedin so we're not talking about like it's it's a it's a it's such a huge vast pool of prospects and people to meet and authorities to meet and just you know and you're only really one connection away from making some big stuff happen Mm-hmm. Right. And and so that's it. I mean, you just want to use it as the platform to meet your next client, your next partner, your next perspective. Um, 
uh, you know, colleague of sorts, your somebody, your referral partner, right? So, uh, so, but that's, and here's one more thing. I'll just say one more okay. thing on this. The average user on LinkedIn has double the purchasing power of any other social media website, right. which makes it important because you're going to find more affluent network and a more affluent crowd in LinkedIn, right? So, and you got to imagine too, it's growing. It's growing really fast. When we first started on LinkedIn, there was 167 million people on there. Nowadays, it's over 5 million or 500 million, mm. right? And they actually got bought by Microsoft for $26.2 billion, right? Mm-hmm. And, which is a huge, huge deal. But if you do the math at this point, they had 450 million members on the platform. They got bought for $26.2 billion in cash, by the way, which is tremendous. Yeah, well. That means that each connection is worth $58.20, right, on the platform. And so what we teach people to do is, is not only to build a list, a database, a following, a tribe, a connections of folks, right? But we show them how to monetize it at that level, right? $58.20 per connection and beyond. Mm-hmm. And that's what we show people how to do. So maybe we can summarize what you actually do from the point that you built this first software tool up to today. What have you built and what does your company actually do for people, uh, Mojo Global? So now we focus on three different areas. We focus on SaaS. We focus on software that clients and customers can use to actually do the prospecting themselves. Beyond that, we also focus on training because just because you have a software, right, you want to know the nuts and bolts of like, how do I do this, right? What messages do I send? We give people templates, email templates to follow up, LinkedIn messages to, to use inside of LinkedIn to actually get results, how to target people, how to find the right prospects, right? Even how to get people on the phone and get appointments and close deals. So we also teach people, we give people training programs and that's another um uh, that's another area of business for us. So SaaS training, and then also now we do done for you because we realize that one of the biggest things is that a lot of people, even if they know what to do, some people just don't have enough time to do it themselves. Mm. And so we wanted to fill this gaping huge hole and we do done for you services. So we'll do done for you leads programs with them. We'll actually go into LinkedIn, um, find their perfect prospects, engage with them, message them, and then they take it from there. So as soon as somebody, a prospect messages back, they're getting them on the phone, getting them onto a calendar meeting and start um, the conversation from that point. Okay, so and there's a few things I want to unpack there just before we wrap up. I know you have to go in about 15 minutes. Um, the the software, what exactly does it do though? Because what, what are you legally allowed to do in terms of scraping content from LinkedIn? Okay, good. So um, so with LinkedIn, it's interesting because like, it, we've. And by the way, it's a Chrome extension, right? Um, it's called Social BFF um, and basically it just it just overlays over it and just acts as if you were there doing all the work, right? So um, so basically, it, what it does is it we've got a free version that can actually generate profile um, traffic to you. So basically, um, it'll go out there and look at people's profiles. Now, there's something inside LinkedIn that'll actually people um, will say, okay, hey, so and so looked at my profile. Then they go check you out. So it's driving traffic to your profile. So that's the first thing it does. And we've got a free version that does that. We also have another version of the software that is a pro version. And what the pro version does is that now this is where not only do you get traffic, but this is how you get clients, right? You invite them to connect with you and then you message them, create databases of people that um, that you can reach out to and nurture, right? That you can put into your CR, uh, CRM. It also is its own LinkedIn CRM because you can keep notes on your people um, and write notes about, so you just open up uh, their LinkedIn profile, put notes in there, hit the save button. You can also tag them and say, oh, okay, so this is this is a joint venture partner potential or this is a, a prospective client potential or this is a person in the mortgage space I want to really own a relationship with. So you can tag them so you can always go back to them and market to them or pull them up and, and resume your prospecting efforts, mm. right? It's like a, at a CRM, later date. CRM sitting on top of LinkedIn. Exactly. Right. Exactly. It'll take it, it'll take LinkedIn um, and it, it may help you do it faster. Because even if you do LinkedIn, it takes time. So our software saves anybody two to four to six hours of time in doing everything manually. Okay. I think the best thing to do because this you know you have an overwhelming level of services here, and they're they're quite different from done for you to software uh, to education. So let's let people explore that for themselves. So what's the the best place to or maybe maybe one or two places to go? Yeah, I would go to um, mojoglobal.com, 
right? And you can you can definitely we've got some free gifts there. Um, if you're interested in done for you, right? Um, then go to done for you leads dot com done for you leads dot com and go check that out um, and if you're and if you're interested in the software then you would go to social bff dot io okay and that's where you can check out the SaaS and see if that's um, that's for you and we'll give away a free version of the software so you can check that out um, so those are those are the main ones um, that I would say social bff dot io um, Mojo Global, if you just want to kind of, we've got some great blogs and information, you want to get some free stuff, go to Mojo Global because we have tons of great free information on our blog. And uh, if you're interested in Done For You, then doneforyouleads.com. Okay. Yeah, because there's a lot there and um, we've, we've, we've been on a journey to reach this point too. So uh, I kind of want to wrap it up with maybe one question or one last question for you, Corey. The, the listener, uh, they've been taking away the journey of a guy who's, you know, you've jumped from a lot of different careers at a young age to I feel like you've cemented a, a very confident um, comfort zone for you of marketing in general and, and certainly as a consultant uh, as a person who's good at building teams to provide these different services from software you know to dump for you to consulting to building funnels um and of course presentations <laughs> you know you're great you're great at giving presentations so you've covered a lot of things that uh we can take away as possible things we might want to focus on but i'd like you to maybe offer a few pieces of advice for a person who's been listening all the way to the end now and is thinking, um, maybe I, I'm a bit like Corey. I've been jumping around all over the place in my career. And, you know, I've, I've, I had something work and then it didn't work. And then maybe there was a stock market crash or a real estate crash. Um, and I, I used to be in you know medicine and now I'm not. And it's, it's obviously a very different world when you leave one career to another one. What would you advise them if they want to get into entrepreneurship, not coming from that background? And in particular, the very tech focused entrepreneurship that you've gone into you know uh how would would you what would you say to them let me give you everybody one huge piece of advice which has been the guiding light in my entire entrepreneurial realm and continues to do so and if there's any one piece of advice i could give to almost anybody it would be this one single thing and that is this find out what you really really want to do right what drives you and what's kind of that thing that you're looking at that gets you super excited and once you figure that out go and find somebody that's already done it and offer them value and maybe even team up with them but learn what they know right and perhaps form a partnership if you do that one thing you're going to save yourself so much time and energy i've done that ever since the beginning um partnered up with people that uh, uh, you know, in real estate, they knew way more than I did. I knew almost nothing, right? Partnering up with Ira, who's got 40 years at this point, 50 years of um, entrepreneurial experience, saved me decades. Partnered up with people that are technology co-founders. That means I didn't have to figure out the technology myself, right? Um, at this point, I'm in talks with uh, some folks starting a venture capital fund, right? I don't have any VC background, but you know, it's always been a dream and desire of mine. So that's uh, that's next on the horizon, right? Um, you know, there's a there's a thing that I want to do. I just produced a book. It's called actthebook.com. Um, and it's uh, the first of its kind. It's a children's book. And it talks about a really complex subject, like the little voice inside your head that's always talking, the one from the moment you wake up, it's telling you how you feel, whether you feel tired or whether you feel great or energized or grumpy. And so right now I'm looking for a partner in that that can help take the distribution on that book to a higher level, right? We only have so much time, both in our lives and in our day. And you can shortcut the system by just finding people that are really great at the things you want to do and teaming up with them, right? So that's that's my biggest piece of advice, and I think it'll always be my biggest piece of advice to anybody. Yeah, that's that's great advice. I'm a fan of partnerships too. I've got a couple going right now, and, and you're right; they're in very different areas, different skill sets, and it's 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 an amazing way to speed things up. Uh, so, great advice, uh, Corey. Huge interview, one of the longer ones. Uh, and you're not an old guy, so you know you packed it into <laughs> those few years. Um, thank you for sharing the the, the long story and uh, giving us the full journey there. Uh, I was going to ask you what's ahead but it sounds like the vc I, I know you did mention that you might want to go for a circle and maybe own your own lab uh you mentioned that earlier in in this episode so is that still on the cards possibly well so one of the things topics that came up literally today um 
with my uh, future partners in this venture capital company is getting into biotech. There's a couple areas that we really want to explore. So yes, absolutely. One day I will, by proxy or investment, uh, own a own a biotech company. So, uh, full so yeah, full circle. That's yeah. a yeah, exactly. So <laughs> it's such an interesting life, um, you know, that we can all live, you know. And uh, yeah, I mean, the big, I just I just focus on things that I like, and you know, and and I and when when opportunities come up, I look at them and I say, wow, this could be huge. Or if I've always wanted to do this, then I then I start investigating it. And then I do it. Right. So it's yeah, it's all it's always an exploration. Right. One of the things I'm doing right now, always wanted to do is travel the world. So uh, and I know you're a huge world traveler as well. And I think a lot of people want to do that. Um, people have this concept about bucket list, right? Like this is it'll be my bucket list. I'll do it before I die. And I was like, to hell with the bucket list. You know, like we've got such a great world. You can travel anywhere. Right. With just you can work anywhere. You have the Internet that um, you could literally operate a business from any corner of the world. Mm hmm. And it's completely different than it used to be. Even a couple of years ago, you couldn't do that because the internet used to not be so good in a lot of places. And you know that. <laughs> well, I've been, I've been doing it for about 15 years. And you're right. I would not have been doing, let's say, video email sequences 10 years yeah. ago like you were doing. Mm -hmm. That would have been a challenge. But thankfully, you can write a blog or send some emails. But we've been able to do that for probably, you know, 15, 20 years. So it. keep it to text-based. You, you, you have been able to do it for a while. But like you said, now um, bandwidth's getting great. Uh, even mobile. I can't wait for like 5G or whatever the next iteration is, then we're going to be limitless, right? Streaming, real-time, smooth, perfect. Just, yeah, like you said, an amazing world. Corey, thank you. Thank you. This is fun. <laughs> good, good to talk to you. Good luck with the projects. I know we'll keep in touch, but thanks for coming on the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. It was, it was awesome. Hey, this is Yarrow. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Entrepreneur's Journey podcast. Now, if you're interested in following in my footsteps and becoming a podcaster, and in particular, you're focusing on conducting interviews with interesting and smart people, then I have the perfect program for you. It's called Power Podcasting, and it's a short course I put together to essentially teach you how to conduct effective storytelling interviews and get all the amazing details out of your guests so you can create very powerful podcasts just like the one you listen to. It doesn't really matter what topic you're covering or what type of guest you're inviting onto your show. My Power Podcasting course will teach you how to conduct the interview, what kind of questions to ask, and also how to use that podcast to ultimately grow your business, which means getting new followers, building an audience, and even using it to sell your products and services and also to create audio products. So you could in fact sell your podcast, make money directly from audio content you create. To learn how to do this, you can sign up for my short course at power-podcasting.com. That's power-podcasting.com. And I can't wait to see you inside that program. Here's a sneak peek for the next episode. It's about building businesses consecutively, not congruently. So build one up, get into a stable cash flow source, and then you can consider starting something else. Thank you for tuning in to the Entrepreneur's Journey podcast, the original entrepreneur interview podcast established in 2005. See you soon.